I like to start off with Twitter. So let's see if anybody has said hello. I asked them to say hello. Greetings from New Orleans. Greetings from Knoxville. Greetings from Baylor, ITS. Hello, Seth Mack. I don't know who that is. That's Twitter. That's a network. That's one way of dipping into the Heraclitean stream of folks who are interested in sharing, interested in connecting. Sometimes they tell you what they had for lunch. Sometimes they give you just in time the resource you've been looking for. And sometimes the resource you're looking for just in time is simply a sense of connection. Connection is important. Connection is essential. Connection is the thing without which we wither. And connection can come in many different forms. Some of them extraordinary. Some of them disturbing. That's part of what we'll talk about here today. So, 1945, Vannevar Bush, science advisor to FDR, one of the folks who coordinated the Manhattan Project, wrote an essay called As We May Think, in which he said, you know, we've gotten all these fine minds together, we've made these connections among people who are at the top of their game, and we've made the most destructive implement known to humanity, this atomic bomb. What would happen if we got these people together, we made those connections in ways that were constructive, things that conduced to peacetime, things that would actually empower us as human beings to solve our problems more capably, to connect better. And he wrote these words, the world has arrived at an age of cheap, complex devices of great reliability, and something is bound to come of it. 1945, vacuum tubes, ENIAC, filling up three or four rooms this size to do something much stupider than my iPhone. <laughs> what did he know? Something was bound to come of it. We are seeing what is coming of it. Some of them are beautiful sights. Some of them not so much. Here's what comes of it. A young man activates a webcam in his roommate's room and streams live to the internet his roommate in an intimate encounter, his roommate male, the partner male. Three days later, after a tweet that had alerted the network, oh, look at this, that young man jumps to his death, we believe, off of the George Washington Bridge. That's what comes of it. It's one of the things that comes of it. And today, right outside my lovely room, there was this newspaper, maybe you've seen it. Has social networking gone too far? And we're hearing a steady drumbeat these days, an internet backlash. Shouldn't we filter? Shouldn't we block? Shouldn't we have a kill switch for the internet? Prince wants us to turn the internet off. He thinks the internet's ruined music, etc. Can't we turn this back, put the genie back in the bottle? Maybe we could outlaw webcams in dorm rooms. But this is also what comes of it. Andrew Sullivan in the Daily Dish, one of my favorite blogs, in the Atlantic Monthly, as it turns out, writes back in March of this year, the internet does it again. And as it turns out, the internet does it again has to do with a webcam. And this was the result.
How many of you have seen Lux Arumque? Uh, I'm sorry to stop it there. The fact is it goes longer than I have time for, but the real fact is I'll get so weepy I won't be good to you anymore. <laughs> to see these people with their webcams in their homes, their dorm rooms, their offices, singing alone but with the understanding, the awareness that they are part of a choir that they cannot yet hear. That also is what comes of it. Lock down the web, lock down the internet, confiscate the webcams, and you get rid of this too. And the difference between that tragedy and the gold light is something I call digital citizenship. And that's what I want to explore with you today. If you want to know more about how this video was made, you can, because Eric Whitaker is a digital citizen, and he blogs about how he did it, what inspired him to do it, the technical, the artistic, the communal, the inspired, the patient de-glitching, all up there on the blog. And if you want more, the comments on the blog from many different nations, including the one Tom. I don't know Tom. I'll probably never meet Tom. But Tom said, I am an old man, yet every now and then something makes me feel optimistic. This presentation did so. Please continue the experiment. You are making hope. And I love the word experiment because he could have said accomplishment, creation. He could have said any number of things. But experiment is right there at the heart of citizenship. Never done. Never quite concluded. Always a little bit out there. Not quite sure. A little like hope. Are we building platforms for this kind of hope in our schools? More to the point, are we equipping our students to build these platforms? Because I want my students to look at this with awe and then do their version of that. I want to build that platform so they can build theirs. On the front page, the question is asked. Communications experts, students, parents, and others wonder whether anything is outrageous enough to shock Americans into realizing that the internet can be as dangerous as it is fabulous. It's a good question, but it assumes we know how fabulous the internet is. We don't. Our students don't. One of the things I want to help them learn is how fabulous it is if they're willing to be part of the network. Instead, we've constructed a model of schooling that sometimes feels to students a little like a pill minder. If it's Tuesday and Thursday, we take the Dr. Campbell pill, been there, done that, look at the watch packing up five minutes before class is over, time for the next pill, time for the next pill. Well, it's curriculum and we have time so everything doesn't happen at once, right? I mean, that's why it was invented and so forth. And yet, it comes out looking like this, right? Or, <laughs> from one of my favorite movies about organizations run amok, Brazil, we say, well, we need, we need a facelift. We need better pill minders. We need creative pill minders. So we'll do team teaching, but we can't really do team teaching because of the FTEs and we have to be productive. So we'll have pseudo team teaching or we'll have team teaching in the winter term and you know how it goes, right? <laughs> Scaling education up, right? It's all content and feeding them and getting them ready for the workforce. I didn't say the marketplace. So we stretch it a little bit tighter. 
with mirrors so we can say, oh, this is working out very well. We actually are, are making very good use of scarce resources. And we have a curriculum that begins to look like, well, over here you bolt on your foreign language, over here you, you bang in your steering wheel, which is your English comp class, over here's your lab science. At the end, where's the integration? Well, you have a car, go wherever you want. Uh, but by then, no, the assembly line has done its work. We now have the little clips to pull it back even farther. I'm assuming the doctor has his PhD. <laughs> or it can look like this. This is not my image. This is Tim Clydesdale from a book called The First Year Out, where he talks about the transition between high school and college. That wonderful time when suddenly students can understand it's not going to be 13th grade. It's going to be something else altogether. And yet, Clydesdale, in the groups that he worked with, found that many students mapped this onto a process of hazing, liberal arts hazing, general ed hazing. I've gotten my requirements over with. I will get this class done. I've completed my requirement. And at the end, yeah, it, it leaves its mark, but not maybe the one we would want. And then at the end, you've got the diploma. You can wrap around it all. <laughs> or we will engage in what I call the I lie. Now, I've got to be really clear about this. The people at my university who work with the course management system, which in our case is Blackboard, are excellent, hardworking, caring people. They are not trying to hurt anyone, far from it. They work themselves to a nubbin trying to support an ever more sophisticated use of, in this case, the course management system called Blackboard. And yet the URL that students go to when they go to the Blackboard site at my university is my dot, your university name, dot edu. This is not theirs. This is not my blackboard. This is my professor's blackboard. It's not even really the professor's blackboard. It's all pre-populated. Everything's nice and neat. You walk in, you put your syllabus up. I'm a citizen of the web. No. I'm a student. I do work. I put it up there. I can access it for the rest of my life. I'll manage it. No. It was available. Now it's not. Time moves on. Next pill. Next semester. Next year. My blackboard.edu? No. No. So there it is. It's an I lie, but it's convenient. You can manage it, etc. And it is not necessarily in itself altogether bad. And as I say, the people who work on it, these are vital people. However, what? How far is this from the Lux Arumque? But it's safe. They're, they have discussion forums on there. They look like email lists. This is what the internet looks like. It's playful. It's unpredictable. It has interesting things. Avatars that mark identity. Pseudonyms. SIG files. Connections to personal home pages. All those things that if you show it to any CMS vendor, well, maybe not any. I'm sure some would be more interested than others. They'll say, yeah, but what does that have to do with learning? If it has to do with the learner, it has to do with learning. And the learners, inconvenient as it may be, are human beings with interests, identities, and a desire for connection. Messy stuff. Connections. Or it can be like a game. The people who make this game understand digital citizenship. They've even got a business model that supports it. This is Little Big Planet. How many of you played Little Big Planet? Okay. If I didn't have a 19 year old, would I have played it as soon as I have? Probably not. So I'm a ringer. Okay. Little Big Planet is a cross between a Renaissance Fair, Monty Python, Kukla, Fran, and Ollie, for those of you like me of a certain age. Um, <laughs> And uh, it's completely engrossing, in high definition, a beautifully playful game. 
and they built something into it. Little Big Planet is a game that has a toolkit within the game to build additional levels for the game. Oh, yeah. The game comes with more gaming for you to create. But that doesn't make it a digital citizen. What makes it a digital citizen is that the levels you create can be uploaded, shared, tagged, rated, and people respond to this and ever. The game's released 27 October 2008. Nine months later, one million user-created levels had been uploaded to Media Molecule servers. Now let's assume 90% of them are bad. Uh, that would leave 100,000. You can't get through all the cool stuff that people are contributing to this game. Seven months later, we're at two million levels. Six months later, at three million levels. And yes, I got that from Wikipedia, but I also clicked through to the source that they cited. Wikipedia cites sources. It's encouraged. <laughs> What's that about? Or we can play it safe. Again, from Brazil. Suspicion breeds confidence. These Kids, their games. We can build our turnitin.coms, but it's an arms race. <laughs> Topic, great leaders, are they born or made? Number of pages, five. Urgency, four days. That's actually very far out, right, for, for many students writing. Academic level, undergraduate, subject area, sociology, style, APA, number of sources, five. Writer level, standard quality. <laughs> then you say, oh, premium quality. How much more is that? And then you write home for money. I need to buy a premium quality term paper. Mom, can you just put a little more in my account? We, we want a habitat. We want our students to flourish. We want a really rich and fertile ecosystem of invention, of people becoming their best selves. But a habitat takes tending, it takes tolerance for chaos, it takes a bigger imagination than that. That's a habit trail. That's not a habitat. And what I'm trying to suggest here is that we tend to build habit trails because habitats are harder and they are risky and they are open and they are messy. Digital citizenship is about habitats, not habit trails. This is what we're looking at. This is what I think is true. We're living in the middle of the largest increase in expressive capability in the history of the human race. I find that exciting. It's also a little daunting. But it's a great time to be alive. I was talking to Bill about this last night on our way to the Palmetto Pig. and I, it's, it's good for a laugh, but I really liked it, so, you know. <laughs> Felt like home. It was good. Um, you know, if you wanted to see Hamlet in its first run, you had to go to the worst part of town, the one on the other side of the Thames. We put it on the other side of the river, and you had to elbow your way past pickpockets and whores to get to this place. And then you could see Hamlet. That's where it was showing. And people would say, you're going to go to a play? Why don't you spend your time with Cicero? That would do you some good. Just a bunch of riffraff there, female impersonators, and you know, crazy maids wearing the clothes that their mistresses have cast off, so you can't even tell they're lower class. It's bizarre. You don't want to do that. You want to do it if you want to see Hamlet. Usually the comparison is to the disruption the printing press caused, which was massively disruptive. Monarchs were executed, blood in the streets. The Roman Catholic Church lost its hold on the Western world with the Protestant Reformation. People complained within 50 years of the invention of the printing press about who's got time for all of this. 
way too many books. Just stop this already. We're looking at something that dwarfs that change. We're looking at something like the emergence of the phonetic alphabet, which Marianne Wolfe in, in, in Proust and the Squid explains makes things happen our brains were not evolved to experience. The way our brains have evolved, they're not reading brains. We make them reading brains. We forge new connections that aren't there naturally. But most people would say, wow, net gain. I mean, Plato was skeptical, Socrates anyway. Um, but I'm for it. I think written language is great. One of the best technologies ever invented. Among other things, it lets me communicate with the dead. Not the grateful dead. Okay. So, these are the faces of our fears. This is what we have to get through to get to digital citizenship. You know, Pandora. Just a little too curious. Everything flies out, except for hope. And I don't know if it's good that hope's in the chest and didn't fly out. No one knows. It's a vexed myth. We just kind of wish he hadn't taken the little peek. And since I'm a Miltonist, I've got to have some Paradise Lost up here. You know, that apple, just too inviting. Better to live in a state of innocence. Or, for gender equality, there's Prometheus, who doesn't end up too happy as liver being torn out by vultures for daring to bring fire to humanity. And of course there's the famous overreaching Icarus. You go up too high, the wings melt, you fall, nobody pays attention. So much for ambition. Although I, I like what Stanley Kubrick says about Icarus. He says, typically this is about overreaching, but I think it's about building better wings. And that's, <laughs> that's why he's one of my favorite filmmakers. Or worse yet, when it just gets to be too much and we feel our eyes glazing over and we feel that we can't really take any more of this tech stuff, there's a kind of contemptuous dismissal that can creep in to our language in which we finally say, you know, it's hula hoops. It's for the kids. It's like glass beads in Manhattan. It's just not so much. Maybe it'll go away like rock and roll. Oh. Oops, that didn't go away. Okay, sorry. Um, maybe like plays. No, they didn't go away either. But it's that, it's that bit of contempt that becomes very, very difficult because that's, that's not going to solve anything. The kids are not going to listen. It's not going to do any good. And it's wrong. These are not hula hoops. The platform, the network, the internet is more like a coffee shop. Or can be. Stephen Johnson in The Invention of Air talks about coffee shops as a great turning point in European history. Finally, we had a stimulant to keep us going through the day instead of beer all day long. Suddenly, everybody got together and they began talking very quickly. And suddenly, the Enlightenment came into being. And Johnson goes on to say that we want to think that the process of uh, Enlightenment goes from confusion to light bulb to clarity, or maybe it's thesis antithesis and synthesis, but really it's a lot messier. It's more like that network. And I think he's right. He says in a book that's coming out very shortly uh, that it's no longer that chance favors the prepared mind. That's true, and it will always be true, but it's also the case that chance favors the connected mind. And we have more opportunities for connection today than ever before. The question is, what do we do with them? How do we make the best use of them? This is a new TED Talk. How many of you look at the TED Talks at TED.com? Unbelievable resource for personal development. They're great for use in class. They're about 15 to 20 minutes long. They're really just astonishing. On the web, for free. And this one came out in the newsletter just a couple of days ago. I am my connectome. And this neuroscientist, that's a neuron up there, by the way, another network. We've got, of course, more of those networks in our brains than there are stars in the universe. And he says that the real identification marker for you as a human being is not your genome. We're going to get some information from that. It's your connectome, which they're actually mapping. 
they're beginning to look at, and it's, it takes astonishing uh, computer power to do this, they're beginning to look at mapping the neural connections within brains because that's where they think the memories are. That's where they think our sense of self resides. That, I would say, the connectome is the chief responsibility and opportunity education presents. Which is another reason I'm so not thrilled by my dot your university here dot edu. Not much connectome generation there. So I want to play for you an audio clip uh, from a friend of mine, John Udell. This is on a podcast series called IT Conversations, which is where I do a lot of my uh, work these days, listening and trying to think about education. Because IT Conversations is not just geek talk. It actually explores what it means to be in a networked world. And John's going to describe how he began to understand himself, how a network could operate. So I want to share this with you. But it's not a context as a service that we provide to one another was really the kind of the key thing. And, and there was a moment where um, this kind of crystallized for me. It's something that Dave Weiner talked about. Um, I can't remember when, but you know, what happened is that one day something interesting happened in the .NET space. And uh, Dave noted it on his blog. But the thing was that Dave um, didn't really know too much about the .NET world. Right? He only knew that there was this blogger and that blogger and then the other blogger who he trusted as authorities in that space. And every once in a while, one of them would, would, would blog something and he would say, oh, you know, that seems like it might be interesting. And another day, another one would pop up and say something. He would sort of take note of it. And then one day, all three of these guys fired at the same time, basically. He went, ah, you know, that means by definition, something interesting and important happened in the .NET space today, right? Like, I just know that a priori because the network told me. And when I reflect on that now and when I talk about that now, um, I, I use, the, the, the terminology that I use is summation. And, you know, I, I, the term comes from biology, right? And it's, it's what happens in a nervous system when you have three neurons impinging on a portal, right? And the signal isn't going to propagate unless all three of the inputs fire. You know, one or two won't do it, right? So, so what, I, what I actually assert is that this, this, this human network that we're creating of, of contextual filters for one another is, in some sense, it's literally a nervous system. Right? It's a nervous system writ large. And so, um, uh, you know, pops up for me is, is hugely important. So it concludes with a term that you might not know. Publishing. It has to do with publishing and subscribing. It's the platform the internet enables primarily by means of what you might have heard of as the blogosphere. And when he talks about the network signaling to itself that something interesting is happening, he's talking about the network built out of people who are actually publishing things to the net, in this case with their blogs. Now what that means is the network that we have in our conversation can propagate through the global nervous system of the internet in such a way that used wisely that global nervous system emerges and you will actually know more than you ought to know. You will know more than you think you know because you are not thinking on, a, on a, an, an unaided uh, platform. You're thinking in concert, though not always in agreement, with many, many others. So I met John through my blog just that way. I started blogging in 2004. With every blogger, I shared the same uncertainty. I don't know who's reading. Well, actually, I did know who was reading. My wife was reading uh, <laughs> because I would ask her if she had read it yet. And so she would, and then she could answer my question. We could move on. Um, and after that, it was my wife and my sister-in-law and my brother. And so, right. But one day I noticed that John Udell, whose blog I was reading, started to track some of the stuff that I was talking about. I thought, oh, this is interesting. We're 
blogging about the same thing and then later I found no he could see because I linked to his blog that I was reading him he therefore came over and looked at my blog to see what I was doing and we began to have a distributed conversation because that's the way that platform works when these individuals are firing together that summation happens and you actually get that propagation he describes I've seen it in the presentations here today, the, the beautiful presentation about the power of story and inquiry that I saw um, just a couple of sessions ago. There's summation. There are people who are firing together like neurons in a richly diverse and interesting brain. Um, that happens at the scale of the network as well and the extent to which the educational environments we build begin to resemble the internet is the extent to which we are equipping our students for digital citizenship instead of the university of name here. You can buy this online at www.ndcenter. Uh, uh, I don't know what that means, but it's all fake diplomas and fake degrees. Moving forward, this is not the model of a global nervous system. This guy might be Benjamin Franklin who published almanacs, started writing pseudonymously, we might even call it a blog of sorts, when he was 16, interdisciplinary, scientist, right? Writer, publisher, editor, diplomat. Pretty good by at wheeling the wheelbarrow full of print paper to his print shop. Pretty good at holding the Constitutional Convention together. Famously remarked at the end of it when he was asked, um, by a woman who was uh, kind of monitoring the proceedings. I don't know what we have here. He said, Madam, you have a republic if you can hang on to it. And I like to think about that in terms of school as well. Walter Isaacson describes him as a successful publisher and consummate networker with an inventive curiosity who would have felt right home in the information revolution. Our students need to be Franklins. This is a model for digital citizenship. And sometimes it means you get your hands dirty with the technical stuff. I love that. Colleagues will say, well, of course, Gardner, you're interested in the technical stuff. I will say, what technical stuff are you talking about? Books? I love books. Are you talking about automobiles? I use them. Are you talking about, oh, you're talking about computers? The technical stuff. Well, if you're going to be a digital citizen, technical stuff is all around you. It's what we make as human beings. A meeting is technical stuff, and sometimes computers work better than that. Also, it's important to think about what the word Franklin means. It means a freeholder. When surnames came into being in England, Walter Isaacson tells us, some people got surnames that were built on the crafts or trades they plied, Taylor, Smith. Some people got surnames based on their own titled inheritances, right? Some people got surnames like Franklin, which testified to a state of being, which in this case is freedom. Digital citizens have the freedom of the internet. So how do we get there? I'm gonna elaborate a little bit on what I think are five steps, not 12, only five. Show you a couple of examples, and uh, I don't wanna run over my time, so let me see. Till 3.45, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, okay, nervous laughter's done. That's good. <laughs> this is where a lot of digital citizenship starts and stops. It's good, but it ain't nearly what we need. Information literacy has to do with students finding the information they need, separating the bad information from the good information. Um, all of that's fine. But that's only a beginning because this assumes they're not contributing themselves. And that's not citizenship. Subscribing is only half of the equation. It's pub-sub, publishing and subscribing. And also what gets left out is what Donald Rumsfeld famously called the unknown unknown, which then has gotten into the vernacular as unk-unk, which is how I spring it on my students because that makes them go, what? Um, the unconk is the unknown unknown. Every information literate person is always saying, what is it I don't even know to ask about? What is it I don't know that I don't know? That too is part 
of information literacy. And that's a, a good start. But then, of course, we have to have digital fluency. Fluency suggests we need to be able to write as well as read. And our students are, are fluent in the sense that they are not afraid of computers, by and large, though some are. They tend to understand that if they mess up, it's not going to blow up the machine. They're a little more fault tolerant. They can be encouraged to be more self-supporting. But there are lots of things they're not fluent in. Publishing to the net, not so much. And that's a critical piece of this. Digital fluency is not just about consumption. It's about how can I responsibly, effectively, surprisingly, creatively contribute to this network. And you can say, well, who has time and who will read it? I don't know. Those are not good questions for digital citizenship. Just start. It's the function of the network that if you do this diligently, your audience will find you. And that's pretty exciting. This is the tough one. This is where the train leaves the tracks. This is where if you're kind of sleepy after lunch, it'll probably, uh, because it's so odd. Meta medium fluency, what does that mean? To me, it means that students need to understand that the computer is a universal machine. It's made to model and simulate other machines. It is like a brain outside of a brain that you can use to think with your brain about your brain and other people's brains. It's a meta medium. It's a tool for thought. Now that's impossibly rarefied and abstract. I will give you a concrete example of it in a moment. But I just want the strangeness to sink in. It's like language that way. Back in the day when I was getting my first computer, I would go to the computer stores and they would always ask me the same question. Sir, because they want to sell to me, right? So they flatter me in my callow youth. Sir, what would you like to use your computer for? And I would say, I would like to use the computer to teach me what I would like to use a computer for. And then they would go on to the other customer because they knew they were not going to make a sale right that minute. Uh, so I eventually went into Cavalier Computers at UVA and just picked out my own computer. Thank you very much. But I was dead serious about it. I don't know. I don't have a computer. How do I know what I want to use it for? What they thought they would hear was, well, I will use it for word processing, a light spreadsheet, and perhaps connect to, you know, no, connecting. That wasn't happening in 1988 when I bought it. So, no, I had this much stranger answer. But it's an answer like the answer, what is your education for? is to teach you what your education is for. Meta medium fluency. I do have a concrete example. The next step is really tricky because it means that our students need to be living significantly on the web. Building what I call a personal cyber infrastructure, which is an environment they have built in a web server environment of these many freely available scripts for blogging, for forums, for I want them to put together something like what I put together and knit their own cyber infrastructure out of this affordance. None of this is happening. How many incoming students are given the opportunity to buy their own domain which will identify them as digital citizens through their lives uh, starting here uh, in their four years. No, we don't do that. No, we give, them a, we, we give them a username. Well, we have to, right? I understand that. However, in a world where people are buying domain names as baby presents, true story, right? Somebody in here may have done it. And what a cool gift, because that URL is going to be your address on this global nervous system and that turns out to matter. Thankfully, my name is Gardner Campbell, so GardnerCampbell.net, GardnerCampbell.org, GardnerCampbell.com, GardnerCampbell.us, those were all available. So I was very happy about that. <laughs> but you know, $8 a year for your digital identity? Not so bad. And of course, when they come into college, they're gonna buy goofy like, I can drink a thousand tons of beer.com. <laughs> but that's where we provide value. Think twice, think three times, Go ahead and buy that, put this part of your digital identity over there, etc. right? We help people make good choices 
We don't block people from making choices. But these are choices that many of our students can't even imagine that they can make. Certainly not within an academic setting. That's the part that breaks my heart. It should be in school where this imagination is most liberated. And what this leads to is Franklin Hood being a digital citizen. So, here's my personal cyber infrastructure, $7.99 a month. These are commodity web hosting services, mine's bluehost.com, it's neither better nor worse than others. I get good customer service every three calls. There's some tolerance you have to build in. It's not quite as bad as airline travel, but you know, you gotta have some tolerance. Um, I can manage my own web server with a graphical user interface. I've got my wife's blog on here. I've got my kids' blogs on here. I've got forums on here. I have used this as a way to build a platform for everything I do online in my teaching and learning. $7.99 a month, all of this available, including Moodle. It's all free. It could all go away at any moment. It could be crashed. It could be hacked into. I don't get the benefits of the enterprise system, but I do get the agility to do many different things and to model, at least in one corner of the universe, something like a personal cyber infrastructure. So, let me show you how this works in my own teaching and learning. Oh, we got another hello from Lollapalooza. I don't know if we've met or not, but I'm very pleased that Lollapalooza checked in. Um, this is the class I'm teaching right now. This is a WordPress blog arranged in a fashion I call a mother blog. And the mother blog is a blog that collects all of the students blogs. Are you with me? Okay. The students could create a mother blog. I could blog. They're, it's the same thing. It's the same stuff. But because of the nature of this connectivity, oh and this is free. The blogging software is free. The URL costs eight dollars a year. The hosting service this runs on costs eight dollars a month. Each of these blogs is completely different. So Bears in the Interwebs, that's his blogging space. He gave it a title. He chose the theme. He had about 100 choices. These are not trivial things. This is his blog. I just aggregate his content into the mother blog. I also aggregate other content. For example, and I apologize for the URL that's run out of control, but sometimes weeds spring up in the habitat. Delicious is a social bookmarking service. I tell my students, put a delicious bar up on your browser bar. When you find something on the web, I know you go to the web, you students, I know you do this. If it's interesting, relevant to class, tag it. What's a tag? Oh, it's a keyword. Anything? Sure. Anything that will help you remember it or you want to search on? Oh. Just make sure one of the tags is our class tag. What's that? Baylor underscore NMS underscore F10. Oh. Then I take the feed from everything that has that tag, bring it in the sidebar. Every time you go to the mother blog, you see an update of a dynamic representation of cool stuff students are finding on the web. Three weeks into the class, one student in her blog said, be sure to pay attention to the thing I delicious. It was a photo from Flickr. So they're starting to get the idea. Oh. You create these streams and you bring them together. On the right, site-wide comments, everyone's comment on everyone else's blog gets aggregated here. Do they read every single one? No. Do they see something new reflecting their own involvement every time they go to the mother blog? Yes. Is that important? I think so. They are creating, they are publishing, I am subscribing, the class is one pub sub extravaganza. I have a partner in crime, a librarian named Ellen Filgo, she's our e-learning librarian at Baylor. Uh, I am professionally in love with her. And <laughs> it's important that gets on the tape. Um, we're, we're both very happily married, not to each other. However, she said, is there any way I could get involved? I said, sure. She said, what if I blogged? I said, great, I will give you your own aggregation space in the sidebar. She did not say, 
what? She said, cool. So now she's up there. And she says, I love being the virtual on-call librarian for the new media studies class, and I'm getting used to the new NMS F10 hashtag this year. Well, we actually started this experiment last year. We're doing it again this time. She blogs, she put resources there, and she interacts with us on Twitter. The students in the class, as the class is going on, have their laptops open. They are tweeting. But they are tweeting observations, notes, comments, questions, representing what they're thinking about, sometimes even what they're talking about in the back channel while the class is going on. All of this open to view, all of this out, so if they're tweeting irrelevant stuff, that too is open to view. Um, and as they do this, she's back in her office, back in the library, across campus. And she's doing what she calls librarian jazz, where she's trying to guess from the tweets, what are they talking about now? She's got the syllabus, she's got the textbook, and she'll insert links. Oh, and here's a link to this thing in the book, and here's a link to this thing in the catalog, and here's a, and now she's actually pre-populating the Twitter stream. Class, I've got a lot of links for you today, and she'll just keep tweeting, right? She's not the librarian. She's our librarian. And we start every class with a ritual opening of the screen, logging on to AirBear, that's our wireless network, and saying, good morning, librarian. And if we feel we're in extra need, we will say, good morning, guardian, librarian. And that works out very well. <laughs> this is a faculty development seminar that I'm leading at the same time. You may notice a resemblance between what I've got wired up for the students and what I've got wired up for the faculty and the staff. That is not accidental. It's the same thing. Each blog belonging to an individual, each blog aggregated into this space. Oh, the header? That's Christina Engelbart and Doug Engelbart. A photo. I took it. These blog spaces can be varied in terms of the look and feel as you go forward, as you move along. That's actually a feature as well. So I'll subtly reinforce whatever we're doing or reading as we go along by changing the header. Next, we're moving on to Ted Nelson. So that's going to be the next header. Um, I promised I'd show you some concrete examples. Here's one. I need to go back a little bit. This was actually so last week. This is a lot of, oh, they're doing a lot of writing. <laughs> ah, yes, that's my secret stealth little um, bonus here. So let's see, where is the one I'm looking? Oh, here we go, this weekend. Let's look at it on her blog. She identifies herself as colorblind, and she had a blog post early on where she explained that. And she writes, and I didn't pay her. This is all class participation. That's how I grade it. Are you robustly participating in class? So classmates, I love it. She's addressing them, not me. Dear Dr. C, here's my term paper. For thousands of years, men and women all over the world have, bam, you know, then I'm asleep. I don't want to read any more papers like that. I want to read stuff like this. So classmates, this weekend I went home to my humble abode in the hill country, Texas. While I was there on Saturday night, we had dinner with our closest family friends, and I overheard my dad and the other dad talking about something they had read about the internet and websites and media. Normally, I would be completely uninterested, but I started to listen, and I actually had things to say. I may have even dropped the name Doug Engelbart while talking about my first year seminar at Baylor. I suppose this blog post is really just a thank you to all my colleagues. That would be her classmates, to Dr. C and our lovely librarian. And I'd be fine to be third in that list, although I'm happy to be on the list. You have all really changed the way I interact with not only the people, but the ideas around me. Topics that used to bore me to the core are now interesting to me. And beyond that, I have useful things to contribute. This class has already been a successful one, and we have so far to go. I can't wait. This simply popped up in the mother blog. I just went to the mother blog and saw this. No assignment, no prompt, nothing. Just robust participation. So I thought, I wonder if we can scale this, because I want to fly a little higher till the wax starts to get really soft. 
So the faculty development seminar is going in concert with the student new media seminar and it's all part of a networked seminar in which other sites and I want to extend an invitation to the University of South Carolina to be part of this next spring because we're going to do it again. There are local sites meeting with a common syllabus plugged in by means of blogging, Twitter, Delicious, etc. to a networked aggregation in which we can see the blogs, we can see the tweets, we can see the delicious resources across all of this network. And what this ends up being is a network that has, and not everyone's checked in, not everyone's participating at the same level, but still, Houston Community College, Tulane, Baylor, Case Western, University of South Carolina Upstate, we're getting there. <laughs> Occidental College probably will join us in the spring. Marcia Schnurring is, a, is scouting it uh, for them. St. Lawrence University, McLennan Community College, Penn State, University of Central Florida, Rice, Monterey Institute of International Studies. Within two weeks of the network going online, someone blogging at the Monterey International, uh, Institute for International Studies quoted a blog post someone at Baylor had written. Now she didn't do the thing she could have done, which is to link, but she'll get there. The fact that it happened at all was pretty amazing. And this is what the portal looks like. These are the blogs. This is the delicious stream. A set of podcasts being facilitated by the New Media Consortium. Tweets, that hasn't caught on so much yet. We'll see how that goes. Um, the blog archive across the whole system and then down there because they are my continuing inspiration, the students in the first year seminar. That's the connectome. Here's the meta medium fluency. This is from an essay we were discussing in class just yesterday. Alan Kay writes, Music is controlled in a completely analogous manner. He's talking about music on this thing he called the Dyna Book, this really harebrained scheme for giving people really powerful computing machines that they could carry around with them, you know, laptops. This is 1977. There were no personal computers except the Alto, which is about as big as a dorm fridge stacked too deep. Um, the Dyna Book can act as a super synthesizer. This is all putative. This is all speculative. They don't have a Dyna book yet. Getting direction either from a keyboard or from a score. The keystrokes can be captured, edited, and played back. Timbres, the fonts of musical expression, contain the quality and mood which different instruments bring to an orchestration. They may be captured, edited, and used dynamically. Here's what happened. I ask my students for what I call nuggets. Places in the text we're reading together that are resonant, or baffling, or perplexing, or repellent, but places we can start, places we can connect ourselves to what we're reading. And Jan, who comes in about three minutes late with a big skateboard, uh, I actually have a little bit of skateboard envy, it's a monster skateboard. <laughs> he says, I've got a nugget, I've got a nugget. I said, what it is? What is it, Jan? He reads this and he said, so I, I realized that it wasn't that we had computers and then musicians thought, well, hmm, well, we got computers. These crazy engineers and their tiny tools have built these things. What can we use them for? Well, maybe we could use them as musical instruments, sort of. Jan said, no, I read this and I got it. Musicians dreaming about music helped to invent computers. I said, that's it. And he got really excited and he picked the book up and he banged it on his head a couple of times. And I was a little worried because it's a heavy book. Um, and he said, this is crazy. I said, no, that's it. We have computers because people dreamed about metamedia. We don't have metamedia because we're trying to make sense of what we do with computers. The dreams came first. So I don't know. What does this add up to? 
A famous Canadian wrote, the aspiration of our time for wholeness, empathy, and depth of awareness is a natural adjunct of electric technology. The mark of our time is its revulsion against imposed patterns. We are suddenly eager to have things and people declare their beings totally. There is a deep faith to be found in this new attitude, a faith that concerns the ultimate harmony of all being. Sounds pretty techno-utopian, but you see looks or rumque, or you watch that kid with his skateboard beat his head in joy with a book that has taught him that the dreams produced the machines and not vice versa. And you start to think that Marshall McLuhan might have been onto something back in 1964. It takes openness. We have to be open to the world. We have to be open to each other. This gets really scary. Teacher open to learner. Learners open to each other. Will we invade each other's private space? Maybe. We have to learn how to negotiate that. And we have to have a place to put the markers of our identity beyond the username we get when we matriculate if we want to know as we are known. And if we are open, we may have a fighting chance of being open to ourselves with the meta-awareness, the metacognition we say we want. Recently, I've been exploring the psychology of interest. I finally got so wound up in my own curiosity that one of my colleagues said, Gardner, I think you're interested in everything. I'm not sure she meant it as a compliment, but I think that it had some um, at least um, wonder in the, in the remark. So I thought, well, yeah, I guess I am. And that's kind of interesting. And then my librarian partner in crime said, I bet you're interested in interest. I thought, that's it. I'm interested in interest. And then she, being a great reference librarian, said, I have a book for you, Exploring the Psychology of Interest by Paul J. Sylvia, who's got most of his articles up online on his web space. He's at UNC Greensboro. And of course, I have his book on my Kindle and have read it at least twice. He points to the derivation of the word interest. It comes from two Latin words, inter essa. And if you look at what that means literally, it means between to be. Hear the connectome? To be between, to put it into good English, or as it's come to mean, taking part. To take part is to be in the connectome, to be in the habitat, to be between. That's what interest is. And we have to build our networks for interest. That means they will be messy. I'm going to close with Clay Shirky and something he said about how to build these platforms of interest. First of all, a contract with the users has to be complete enough to get them interested, but not so complete that it depresses them. Second of all, you have to understand that the users who are coming in are motivated to do things that you did not predict. And the more you try to predict, the more those motivations will go towards the destructive. They'll, so you have to give them space to participate. Otherwise, they feel like they're just minimum wage employees without even getting minimum wage. And third, in the domain of collaborative production, it is Heisenberg's press release. The more completely in advance you take credit for future success, the less likely that success becomes. Now, if I asked you to make a list of three characteristics that would flummox a bureaucracy, would your list look much different than that? That's why this stuff is hard. Right? It's not hard because of the technology. It's hard organization. There's no more robust observation in a 40-year history of writing about social software than that the users never do exactly what the designers either want or expect. Right? And that's not if the application is failing. That's if it's a success. Right? Failure is nobody uses it at all. Successful applications create surprises. And if you want to take advantage of the collaborative and participatory zeal of the users, you're not doing it despite the possibility of surprise. You're doing it because of the possibility of surprise. And the key right, is to make an incomplete contract of the sort that invites the user in 
and lets them know that you understand that they want to, and you want to help them make those surprises as creative as possible. Word user, substitute the word student, and I think you get the secret sauce, the inter essa of the network without and the network within. These Franklins are important too. This is the digital citizen. Ted Nelson said in 1974, you can and must understand computers now. He foresaw the consequences of not understanding computers as being enslaved to the technology, enslaved to what others provide for you. He thought that would be something like IBM running the world server that we would all pay subscriptions to. Well, we got the internet instead, an opportunity for all of us to understand digital citizenship, but the need for understanding, the necessity, the moral imperative for understanding has never been greater. Janet Murray sums it up better than I could. This is what we face. The task is the same now as it ever has been. Familiar, thrilling, unavoidable. We work with all our myriad talents to expand our media of expression to the full measure of our humanity. To which, would add, which I would add, we do it with a network. Thank you. You know, the technology will continue to advance. If we are not prepared to be digital citizens, then we're not going to be making the best choices we can in terms of what we do with this amplification. Um, because the internet turns human beings up to 11. And it's nice if we could make music instead of just, you know, cacophony as we turn things up to 11. But we don't do it by blocking, we do it by being free. Um, so yeah, very good, very good observation. There was a hand up over here. Yes? So, uh, does your class meet in a classroom and all yes. students have their phones or their uh, computers? Yes. Yes, we're in a classroom. They all have their, some of them will use their phones if Air Bear is not, you know, uh, if it's having some hiccups that day. Uh, they'll get onto the 3G or whatever they've got available. Uh, because it's Twitter that we're using for the in-class stuff primarily. Um, but yeah, we're all doing that. Uh, how do I know they're not Facebooking? How do I, I don't. I don't know that at all. What I know is if they're not paying attention to the Twitter stream, the interesting things they're missing are the things their classmates are contributing. And I've seen some very strange phenomena emerge from this, including one last fall, which is my favorite story to tell, in which a student responding to another student's presentation came up with an idea for a question, which then somebody across the room interacted with and said, yeah, I was wondering about that too, and then having bounced their ideas off of each other in the back channel, the first student raised his hand and asked a better question. Um, that was a revelation to me. Um, they also will say things that will be interesting to me in terms of what do they remember and what, what, what were they not, you know, what, what went by them. Um, and the interaction with the librarian has also been very, very beautiful. Quick story about that. Um, we have a, a lovely facsimile edition of the original uh, Computer Lit Dream Machines uh, book that Ted Nelson self-published, by the way, so much for peer review. Uh, <laughs> it's like a choose-your-own-adventure book. You flip it over and read it this way, or you flip it over and read it this way. It's a very, very cool book. And we were talking about Ted Nelson, and I wasn't watching the Twitter stream because I was you know, kind of facilitating the discussion at the front of the class. So I didn't know what the students were saying. I, I rarely do. What they saw on their Twitter stream is that the librarian first said, Ellen first said, I have this book over here if you'd like to come see it. And then because she's Ellen, she said, well, the heck with that. I'm planning something. And the student said, oh, I think it's going to be cool. And in the meantime, the class is going on. We're having an excellent discussion about Ted Nelson. Long story short, I get to this really ringing, you know, pronouncement about something or other, you know, where it sounds like, wow. This is great. And I stopped. And the door opened. And Ellen walked in with the book. And the students knew she was on her way. I did. 
and she could not possibly have picked a better moment to enter. And what I'm saying is the dramatic situation was perfect. I was caught completely off guard. The students knew something I didn't know, but it was special, completely related to what we were doing, and it took the class right up to the next level. And it was great. It was just fantastic. Um, so uh, it, was, it was good. It was good. It was fun. Yeah. Hey, um, I was just wondering, I, I've taken online courses, and I wanted to know if, what your opinion was about online courses. Can you know, the internet replace teacher instruction in the classroom experience, or is it merely like a supplement to classroom experience? For me, it all has to work together. It's about mutual augmentation. Um, I don't think anything can replace anything else, but it, it depends on your context. It depends on how you weave things together. I'm a big fan of blended designs where you actually do meet in person first, establish some level of trust and familiarity, and then what you can do online can, can really be um, liberating. You, you know, you've got that sense of community. My sense is that many online courses do not take full advantage of the way online connections can be used um, because they're locked down in particular course management systems, because um, they don't look like the rest of the internet. Um, if, if online communities couldn't form in meaningful ways, Facebook would not have 500 million users. Um, but I think it does take weaving together. I, I'm not, I mean, I'm a kind of a multi format person. Uh, I like books, I like ebooks. I like reading on a screen. I've got books I've ordered and I read on my iPhone. I, you know, it just doesn't, they're all kind of there, and I, and I wouldn't want any of them to go away. I have about 2,000 vinyl records, which suddenly makes me cool again with students. <laughs> Dr. Campbell, you have vinyls. I said, oh, you mean records? Yeah, because they're called vinyls now, right? And I convinced a student that the Beach Boys Pet Sounds vinyl was something you really should have. Nobody would be, you know, complete without it. He bought it. And he got a USB turntable for Christmas. And he wrote me, he said, Dr. C, I got pet sounds for Christmas and a USB turntable, and I ripped my vinyl. And I thought, oh, that's terrible. So I realized what he meant was I digitized it. So we're in a hybrid world. And for me, the hybridity is where the magic is. So I don't, I don't think about replacement. I think about how these things get woven together.